Well, hello, everyone. Shh. Let me just get your attention just for a few moments here. I want to thank you for being here tonight. If you guys want to turn your chair around, it's going to be a, quite a crick in your neck if you try to do that for the three hours I'm going to be speaking. Um, hey, um, welcome to Alpha. Uh, how many of you guys here for the very first Alpha? Never done Alpha before. Never heard any of my bad jokes. Great. You're going to love my jokes. Um, well, my name is Frank Floria, and uh, I have the privilege of hosting uh, the Alpha Course here at Lakeview Christian Center, um, along with our pastor, Steve, uh, Keith Collins. Uh, and this Alpha marks the 38th time we have had Alpha at, uh, at Lakeview, if not for Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and Hurricane COVID, which I think is the longest lasting hurricane in the history of the Gulf Coast, um, this would be our 40th Alpha. And uh, tonight, typically, on a typical Alpha, we'd have anywhere from 200 to 230 people here. And so our, our numbers had been decreased a bit. Um, but, and those are all for COVID purposes. And, but we're also, wanna, I wanna take a second to welcome the people that are watching online. Thank you for for joining us and want to welcome you to join us for the next nine weeks as well. So let me tell you a little bit about me. I'll, take, I'll give you a little bit of the history of the Alpha course and why I believe it's going to be worth your while to be here as often as you can over the course of the next nine Tuesdays. So a little bit about me. Uh, I own a small professional search firm um, that I've just across the canal there that I've worked at for 42 years. Does that even seem possible? Um, my wife and I have attended uh, this church for over 41 years. Uh, they still haven't figured out how to get rid of us, but um, I'm sure they're working on that. But one of the first things I want to do, most important things I can do is introduce to you my better three quarters on her worst day. So, sweetheart, that's my wife, Annette, over there. So, she deserves a much bigger applause than that for being married to me. Uh, <laughs> Um, so she is my wife of 43 years, one month, uh, 27 days, eight hours, about 38 minutes. Um, we have th three grown children who are married to three other grown children. And, uh, and they have just, we had 11 grandchildren and one on the way. And just last week we saw our 12th grandchild, which we're very excited about. It's nine boys, three girls. The boys are still greatly outnumbered. Uh, so anyway, but Annette went to Dominican High School. I went to a military school called New Orleans Academy. Um, I was uh, in the top 18 of my class of 21. Um, and uh, I decided not to get a college education, so I attended Louisiana State University. Um, I know you hate that joke. But I, I, I joined the original Animal House. I was a deke at LSU. Anybody familiar with the deeks? At, uh, yeah, thank you over there. Um, uh, but that's, really, that's where I first met Annette, uh, swinging from a chandelier. And, uh, and that's really where she caught my eye, with her heel. And then uh, my shoulder with her knee, and down we went, and she's been all over me ever since. <laughs> well, that's really not true, but I enjoy getting to say it. Um, so the Alpha course really start, it started back in London, England in 1977. Um, an attorney who became a minister, and I don't know if that's possible, but an attorney became a minister, um, Nicky Gumbel. He took this fledgling in-house Bible study at Holy Trinity Anglican Church, uh, and this little Bible study called the Alpha Course exploded into today what is a course that has gone all over the world, over a, a hundred languages and more than 130 countries, and it's embraced by virtually every Christian denomination. Uh, it's so interesting that we've had church leaders, uh, we've had uh, education leaders from churches of different denominations, we've had uh, pastors from Baptist churches and Methodist churches and in interdenominational churches, uh, we've had uh, five or six Catholic priests come with their directors of, of Catholic education. It's just been a joy to, to host so many different folks from coming from different backgrounds. And so, um, so over, you know, since Alpha started, over about 28 million people across the globe have attended Alpha. And uh, you know, our very first Alpha was one week to the day after the towers went down 
at 9-11. Uh, on 9-11, and uh, that was quite a moment. Um, and in the 21 years that we've had Alpha here, I think we've had over 8,000 people attend. So it's a joy for us to do this. We love Alpha. And so thank you guys very, very much uh, for being here, being willing to be here. I hope you've uh, enjoyed yourself so far. So what is Alpha? Well, Alpha is really an introduction to the Christian faith. Which sounds kind of strange. Like, I mean, I, I grew up in this denomination or that denomination. Why do I need an introduction to Christianity? Because Alpha is really an introduction to the Bible. If Christianity is anything, it's what the Bible says it is. And what the Bible says it's not as well. And so it's an invitation to come and to think and to reason and to listen and to talk in a totally non-threatening atmosphere. And to talk about what the, what the Bible has to say about God and what the Bible has to say about us and what the Bible has to say about God and us and us and one another. Uh, and that's, when I'm done here, that's what we're going to do among our tables tonight. Just take some time, throw out some questions, get some thought. And, uh, and you're going to find that's the fun part of the evening. That's really a whole lot of fun. It's worth listening to me just to stay for that part. But I also want you to know what Alpha is not. Okay? It's important that you know what Alpha isn't. Uh, Alpha is not an effort to get you to change your denomination or to change your church. Uh, this is not a church membership drive. Uh, and we are not saying, hey, it's free, but we're really hoping you're going to give us an offering because we say it's free. No. This is something we are so excited about doing. And so nobody's interested in anything but you being here. And I want you to know that. And I don't expect you to believe that because you don't even know who I am. I went to LSU. I was a deke. You know, I, so, um, and, and I'm a headhunter. So, I mean, what, what, if you don't, that's, never mind. Um, so, you know, our hope is this, that in the midst of our 100 mile an hour lives, we will just, you'll be willing, at least on Tuesday nights, to just hit the pause button and think about questions about life that we really do need answers to. Important questions for our entire lives, not just for a moment in our lives. Questions that need to be, if we really think about this, answered for the course of our lives. You know, it was, it was Socrates uh, who said, the unexamined life is not worth living. That's quite a statement. If, if we're to you know, if, if we're going to attain what the vast majority of us, particularly in America, say we're looking for, I mean, what are we looking for? We're looking for happiness. We're looking for meaning. We're looking for purpose. We're looking for life to be fulfilling. That's what we want. But, but if that's really what we're looking for, we're going to have to answer the question, well, what do I believe brings that? And why do I believe a particular thing brings that? So not just the what of what we believe, but why do we believe what we believe? Why do we not believe what we do not believe? But again, for that to happen, it's going to take an investment of time. We're going to have to tap the brakes. Maybe some of us are going to have to slam on the brakes. Some of us may need to get our cars immobilized so that we just will sit and listen, which we have such a hard time doing today. I want you to give you an, in, I thought it was a very insightful thought from a guy by the name of Oz Guinness, author, uh, international speaker, and he kind of expands on Socrates' quote, the unexamined life is not worth living. Here's what, here's what Oz Guinness said. He says, now think about this, younger, middle-aged, and older. Um, he says, most of us feel immortal in our teens and 20s. Then we move through life so fast into our 30s and 40s that we lose sight of the journey and think only of our careers. Even in our 50s, we barely hear the roar of the rapids several bends down river. Then he asks this question, have you awakened to the journey of life? Or are you among those just drifting down the years? Are you among those so caught up on the project of themselves that they choose not to hear the flow of time? Are you living an examined life? Or are you living in the hand-me-down ideas of others? Are you open to the full interrogation of life? 
Or are you closed to the search because you believe what you've always believed without question? That's an interesting statement. I think it's one worth really pondering. See, you think of people who have made it to the top of their profession. I mean, think, we, we know about, I don't know how many of you know people that have made it to the top of their profession. Maybe some of you are here tonight, I don't know. But certainly people who have made it to the top of their trade or their profession, I mean, they don't have any questions about meaning and purpose, right? No, that, that wouldn't be right. So let me just give you a few quotes here from some folks maybe you're familiar with from different walks of life. Shia LaBeouf, you guys have seen him, all the Transformer movies and all that stuff. Um, here's what he said. He said, sometimes I feel I'm living a meaningless life. I get frightened. I know one of the luckiest dudes in America right now. I have a great house. My parents don't have to work. I got money. I'm famous. But it could all change, man. It could all go away. You never know. And he says, I don't handle fame well. He really doesn't. He's been arrested by at least four times. I think there's a current lawsuit that he's dealing with as well. He says, I don't handle fame well. But most actors on, I don't know if I believe this. Most actors on most days don't think they're worthy. They are so humble, aren't they? <clears throat> I have no idea. I have no idea where this insecurity comes from. But look at this. It's a God-sized hole. If I knew, I'd fill it. And I'd be on my way. Now, some of you have heard of Tom Brady. From the Brady Bunch. He was a kid on the <laughs> top block. <clears throat> so Tom Brady, you know, and this is, this, I'm about to show a little video. Uh, this is from 2005, an interview he had with Steve Croft of 60 Minutes. In 2005, he'd only won three Super Bowl rings, okay? He was harmless when he was at New England. We hate him now, don't we? Now that he's at Tampa. Um, but we still beat him two out of three, but not the one we needed to win. Okay, so this is, this is Tom Brady in 2005. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and, and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what it is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life is me. I thank God. It's got to be more than this. I mean, this, isn't, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. I mean, I've done it. I'm 27. And what else is there for me? What's the answer? I wish I knew. I wish I knew. I mean, it's, I think that's part of me trying to go out and experience other things. But there's a, I know, I love playing football and I love being the quarterback for this team. And, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of other parts about me that I'm trying to find. Hmm. So even Tom Brady at the top of his game when he's 27, and he's still going at it. But I don't know that his answers will be any different today than they were 15, 16 years ago. Ted Turner. Uh, Ted Turner's worth about $2.2 .2 billion. He used to be worth about $8 billion. Um, I don't know if any of you have lost $5.5 .5 billion in your lifetime. Uh, but he was interviewed by Barbara Walters. Uh, and Barbara Walters asked him the question, Ted, what do you mean by success? What to you is successful? And here's what Ted Turner said. I think it's kind of an empty bag, to tell you the truth. You've really got to get there to really know that. Money doesn't buy happiness, and neither does honors or position and awards or trophies. I mean, these are the guys that have reached the pinnacle. And they're still saying, that's just not it. Jim Carrey. Um, by the way, there's, there's Ted today. I didn't know, just a little bit older than he was then. Jim Carrey, I love Jim Carrey. Don't you love Jim Carrey? Nutcase. Okay, um, he said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. I mean, these are, these are people that are worth billions and multiple millions of dollars. Uh, Ralph Barton was a tremendous uh, political cartoonist back in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, he, this is what he wrote. He said, I've had few difficulties, many friends, great successes. I've gone from wife to wife. If he was honest, he'd gone from wife to wife, to wife, 
to wife. He was married four times. And from house to house, visited great countries of the world. But I am fed up with inventing devices to fill up 24 hours a day. Now, that note was found on his pillow after he killed himself. Successful, world-renowned cartoonist of some of the most famous people that lived in the 20s and 30s. And he got, filled, got fed up with inventing devices to fill up a day. Donald Kalish, who was the, I think he was the director of the, the, the philosophy department at UCLA. This is what Dr. Kalish had to say. There is no system of philosophy to spin out. Okay, what's philosophy? Philosophy is a framework or a grid whereby we try to make sense out of life. There's no system or philosophy to spin out. There are no ethical truths. There are just clarifications of particular ethical problems. Take advantage of these clarifications and work out your own existence. You are mistaken to think that anyone ever had the answers. There are no answers. Be brave and face up to it. Wouldn't you want him as your professor? Wow. Well, with all due respect to the now late Dr. Kalish, he, he, he contradicts himself, really, when he says there are no answers. Because to say there are no answers is an answer, in fact, to the question, are there any answers? You have to think about that a little bit. The professor also said that life has no purpose. But he made it his purpose in life to tell people that life had no purpose. So should we believe Dr. Kalish's philosophy of life, what's supporting his position to make him an authority on what he says other than a bunch of letters behind his name? See, the Bible takes issue with Dr. Kalish. The Bible that I had never read does claim to have answers to the essential questions of life. Now, look, I'm, I'm going to tell you this early on. I'm not asking you to believe the Bible. I'm not asking you to believe anything I say. You shouldn't. I'm, what Alpha is is an opportunity to say, what does the Bible say? Whether I believe it or not, wouldn't it be at least a good idea to find out what it says? Is it, does it have any purpose or meaning? Is there anything to support these massive claims for every one of our lives? If it's true, there's not a more important book ever. Let me ask you this question. How many of you, now, you don't have to answer this question, you don't have to raise your hand, but, but I wonder how many of you grew up as a regular course of your life reading the Bible? Kind of looking into the Bible, reading the Bible, maybe asking some questions, maybe studying a little bit. Well, typically, when this room is full on the first week with 200 to 230 people, I will ask that question. And in the 30, 37 times I've asked this question, I have never, ever had more than 11 hands go up. And I typically get five to seven at the most. Hmm. You see, answers to, the, to worldview questions, philosophy questions of origin, where'd I come from, purpose, why am I here, destiny, where am I going? Uh, those are important questions, but really, do you really care much about where you came from? Aren't you really more concerned about why am I here, really? I mean, I think that's what we would all honestly say. I, I don't want to think about where I'm going because if it's anything with those religious people say, I don't want anything to do with that. You know, I came from my mom's womb. That's fine. What the heck am I doing here? You may be asking yourself that right now about Alpha. Uh, but... The Bible claims that God made you and me to have meaning, purpose, fulfillment. And as I said, I am not asking you to believe that. But if the Bible is true, Jesus made an incredible claim. Now, next week, our topic is who is Jesus? So next week, we're going to talk about a lot of things, evidences pertaining to the person of Jesus. But he made an incredible claim. He said that he came that we would have life to the full. In the midst of the hell that this life often brings, he says, in the midst of that, I come to give you life fully. 
But to believe that requires faith. Now, if I ask you a question tonight, um, are you a person of faith? Um, do you have faith? Maybe you say, oh, not so much. But the fact of the matter is you and I exercise faith every, about every moment of every day. Faith is not necessarily a religious term, but we always connect faith and religion and it kind of stops there. No, no. Faith is what you and I do all the time. Do you, have you ever watched the weather? I mean, kind of, you know, when, you know, when, when, you know, when it's Hurricane Ida, okay, or some storm's brewing or something, you got a big event, you don't want it to rain. Uh, what do you do? You watch the weatherman. And what do you do? You believe in faith that he's going to get it right. Um, with all due respect to meteorologists. I, um, but how often have they gotten it wrong? I mean, this is a science, right? Um, but I, you know, I just, I think, so, I think meteorologists should only be able to get it wrong so many times and then that's it for them. They just, you know, just haul them off to jail. You know, you, if you can't tell us where the rain cell is, we're going to tell you where the jail cell is and you're going there. It just, it's kind of unnerving when you plan that trip and it doesn't happen. Um, now, how many of you drove here tonight? Everybody drove here? Nobody took the bus tonight? Okay. Um, you drove here in faith. You expected your car to start when you turn on the ignition. You expected your brakes to work when you tap the brakes. You expected when, you, when the light turned green for you, you were going to go and you believed that everybody was going to stop, right? When their light turned red. That's all faith. I'm not saying it's blind faith, but it's faith nonetheless. And, I, and I, I've kind of looked at some of the cars in the parking lot tonight, and I want to say some of you drove here in a lot of faith, some of the cars I've seen. So uh, congratulations on that. If you need a jumper or anything like that, we'll be around here late to, to help you. Um, but hey, did you enjoy the meal tonight? Did you enjoy those of you ate? Did you, you thought it was good? Good, good, good. Did you meet the chef, by the way? Do, do you have any idea what kind of day he had? He was, he was ticked. I mean, this is not a good day for him. Um, lots of things. He's sick of work, you know, working behind the scenes, cooking for Alpha all the time. And so what if tonight he just decided to put a little extra in your food that you're going to be reminded of at about two in the morning? And you say, oh my, I got to, I got to go see a doctor. Well, so you ate tonight in faith, didn't you? You have no idea what you ate. You just ate and ate. And some of you ate and ate, but then you have to go see the doctor. Is this the doctor you're going to go see? Okay. You, you go to a doctor in faith. What are you looking for? I'm looking for all those diplomas on the wall and the fellowships and everything else. Why? Because I want as much evidence as I can possibly get to know that I'm going to the right doctor. Um, any of you guys enjoy flying? How many people enjoy flying? Okay. You're a strange. Okay. But no, thank you, Gina. Um, uh, so, uh, but I mean, how many of you would love to have been on U.S. Air Flight 1549? Okay, flying out of LaGuardia Airport on January 15th. The air temperature is a balmy 18 degrees. Water temperature, 35 degrees. Now, you, you know this story. Um, it kind of brings new meaning to flying on a wing in a prayer, don't you think? Um, but here's the real problem behind this as as U.S. Air Flight 1549 ascended into the skies. Uh, the real problem was illegal aliens. I don't know if you knew that. Illegal aliens. It was an immigration problem. It was a gaggle of undocumented Canadian geese that went right through the jet engines. You gotta do something about these undocumented Canadian geese. It's just really bad, like this joke. Um, <laughs> but we all, have, we all have faith. We all have faith. If anybody ever served on a jury, okay, I've served on a jury and the judge charges us to come to a decision beyond, not beyond a shadow of a doubt. He says, come to a decision beyond a reasonable doubt. You look at the evidence and you make a decision. Now, I asked this question at Alpha as well, and I'll ask you this question, but you don't have to raise your hands. I'll ask this question. There's two 230 people in the room. And I asked the question, 
How many of you believe, and ask yourself this question tonight, how many of you believe there's something on the other side of your last heartbeat? How many of you believe there's something on the other side of your last heartbeat that's going to last forever? Do you know how many hands go up? Virtually every hand in the room goes up. So in a room of 200, 230, I got 98% or so of the hands in the room go up. That sounds American. I mean, that, that sounds, you know, we've been church, you know, we, all that. That's, that's fine. But my question is, based on what? Based on what? Um, I, want, I want to give you a little example tonight that I'm going to ask my bride, first time I've ever asked her to come do this with me. Um, but this, if I can find the end of this, yeah, Sweetheart, I'm going to let you take this. I'm going to go here and I want you to stand right there in the middle of that, right? Stop right there. Okay. Okay. Now you can't see this little, you can see this little thing. Can't you guys back there? Okay. Let's just call this physical life, right? Pop out of mom's womb pop into the mausoleum, okay? <laughs> All right, so life and death, physical life. Now, you have absolutely no idea where you are on the continuum of that, do you? You don't know that this could be it tonight, do you? You hope that chef was not that angry, All right? But you don't know that, do you? We are somewhere along the continuum of life, and the heart is beating. Now, what's so interesting is this. We spend so much time in this little bit of time trying to figure out how we're going to make life full by the college we attend, the house we buy, the neighborhood we, we live in, the car that we drive, the profession that we have, clothes that we wear. People that we know, I mean, vacations, you know, making sure, I mean, we'll spend months going, you know, going through, are we going to the right vacation and all these other things. Everything is so important, you know, and, and God forbid if we get into the wrong cell phone policy. I mean, we just thrown two years of our lives away if we get into the wrong cell phone policy. So, so, but here's what's so interesting. We know that life is only for this long. You know, I don't know if you heard this or not, but the death rate, it's 100%. Nobody gets off of this planet alive. But it's so weird. None of us think we're actually going to die. It's really, it's kind of strange that way. But why is it we spend so much time dealing with, not that we shouldn't be thinking people, calculating in what we do. We should be. But why is it we spend so much time thinking about things that are going to last just a little bit of time? But we say that there's, there's something, we believe there's something on the other side of our last heartbeat that's going to last forever. And we hope so. How, how do you know it's going to be good? If you believe that something lasts forever, how do you know it's going to be good? Can you know it's going to be good? Well, wouldn't it make sense if something's going to last that long that we put a little bit more thought into it than we put into a two-year cell phone policy? Than the car we're going to drive for maybe the next three years? Than the sneakers or the teeth? Uh, the uh, tennis shoes we're going to wear for the next six months. Uh, and so this is, this is what I get so excited about Alpha about is we rarely think here. See, I'll just call this the dash and I'll call this the line. C.S. Lewis said this, and I'll give you a little bit more background C.S. Lewis said. He says, if you live just for this life, you basically have nothing because it's all gonna end. Ted Turner's gonna die, Tom Brady's gonna die, Shia LaBeouf's gonna die, Frank Loria's gonna die, even 20-year-olds in this room are gonna die, we're all gonna... But Lewis said this, if you live for this and the joy that is promised in this, you get joy in this life thrown in too. Now, C.S. Lewis may have been off his rocker, I don't know. But that's a comment that he made. And so what we're going to want us to do is just think about this. Am I living for the dash alone? Or am I aware of a line that's going to last, according to what most people say, the vast majority of people say, it's going to last forever. So the dash, the line, we'll be talking about that a lot more 
through the weeks. I'm coming to you. Thank you. <laughs> You're okay. welcome. Oh, I know. I steal a kiss from her however I can. Okay. So here's what, here's what Ray Pritchard had to say about, about this. Ray Pritchard, author, pastor, said this. And the more I think about this, the more I realize it's true when I just look at humanity as a whole. He said, we were made to know God. We are incurably religious by nature. That's why every human society, society, no matter how primitive, has some concept of a higher power, some vision of reality that is and goes beyond nature. C.S. Lewis, I just in introduced you briefly to him in a, a minute. C.S. Lewis was an atheist who la a little later in life became a theist and then a couple of years after that became a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, Lewis was the, uh, a professor of ancient English literature at both Oxford and Cambridge universities in London. This is what Lewis said. He says, if I find, this is good, if I find in myself no, uh, a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, no amount of Super Bowl rings, no amount of buildings named after yourself, no amount of anything. The most probable explanation, Lewis concludes, is that I was made for another world. That's quite a provocative statement. Augustine said this. Now, Augustine, you know, we know him as Saint. We think that's his first name, Saint Augustine. Uh, Augustine uh, was kind of like the Hugh Hefner of the 300s. I mean, this guy was a philanderer, if ever there was one. And uh, he, became, he became a follower of Jesus. And look what he says here. He sa in his prayer, he says to God, God, you made us for yourself. And our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Interesting word. Our hearts, our mind, our will, our emotions, our thinking, our feeling, our choosing. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Now, that's either true or false. I'm not asking you to believe whether it is or not. But is your heart restless? That's the question. See, we seem to have trouble finding our way. Um, and that's the Bible's declaration as to the necessity of the incarnation of the Son of God. And if you will, it is the necessity of heaven's assault and rescue mission on the inhabitants of planet Earth, according to the Bible. See, th you know, throughout the Bible, I saw declarations that Jesus made about himself that are so contrary to what I assumed about his purpose of coming to earth. Uh, I just assumed a lot of things because I never, oh, I had no idea what was in the Bible. I didn't know what a Bible was until I went off to college and somebody on the corner of Dalrymple and Highland Road was uh, standing under a tree and handing me this little green book, which was a Bible. I'd never read it. I knew nothing of what was in it. But I want to do this. I'm going to touch on three things that Jesus said about himself. I'm going to be done. Th three things about himself that if true, if true, have dash, okay, have dash and line consequences to them. In other words, now and forever consequences to them, ramifications for each of us. So it's recorded in the Gospel of John, which is the fourth book in the New Testament, in the 14th chapter, the sixth verse, when Jesus was asked a question, Jesus answered, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Now, Jesus did not say this. He did not say he was the rules. He did not say he was the commandments. He didn't say it was church attendance. He didn't say that doing good was the way. He didn't say that praying was the way. He's not opposed to anything, but he's saying, making a very marked statement. He said, I am the way. See, Jesus understood the condition of each and every one of our hearts. I said a moment ago, restless, 
unsettled, wayward, empty even, confused, heartbroken. I mean, what's the condition of your heart? I mean, you could probably fill in some blanks. I could fill some blanks in. You could probably fill some blanks in. What is the condition of your heart? See, Jesus said he was the way to God that gives us so that we can have confidence in the dash and in the line. He said that I've, I am the way to God so you can have confidence in the craziness of this world and in that which is going to last forever after your last heartbeat. Here's a couple other scriptures I'd like to just give you real quickly. Again, he said, I am the way. See, he understood our condition. Here's Jesus saying to his disciples, he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Now, th these are some serious statements. Okay, I and mean, we need to take them seriously. This guy is either telling the truth or he's lying. We're going to talk a whole lot more about that next week. Can we believe anything that Jesus said? Did he even exist? Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life, and he who comes to me shall... You see this word here? Never. You know what never means, don't you? It means never. That's what it means. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. Now, he's not talking about the fact that he's a soup kitchen. He's not saying that. He's saying that that emptiness inside of us, he's the only one that can fill that up. He's, and he's not saying your religious activity will do that. Your piety will do that. He's not saying that. He's saying, I will do that. Not a litany of rules and commandments. He's saying, I, who I am, will do that. He fills our hearts and our souls with life, that fullness of life that he talked about. He also said that, that he was the door. He said, if anyone comes through me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. And then he said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. He said, he's the door. In other words, I'm the way and the way is through this door and I am that door. And if anyone enters to me, he will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from wandering. Saved from going in the wrong direction. Saved from being so frustrated and empty and angry in the dash, in the midst of what life feeds us and gives us. He says, I will be that way for you when life doesn't make any sense. And not only can you be confident in that, I'm losing my life here, um, you can be confident that the moment your heart stops, you'll be with me forever. It's quite a statement, quite a statement, these never and forever statements that he makes. You will go in and out. I love this. You go in and out and find pasture. Okay, that is a statement of rest and security. Right? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me, right, beside still waters. He gives me a place of refuge. So, so Jesus said he's the way. He also said that he is the way and the truth. Now, someone asked, particularly in the realm of religion, isn't it enough just to be sincere in your beliefs? Does it really matter just as long as you're sincere? I, well, I'm not so sure. But what does sincerity have to do with truth? I mean, think about that. Can't I believe something sincerely? and be sincerely wrong? I mean, if you walk up to your professor and say, Professor, I, am, I know you marked this wrong, but I sincerely believe it's right. What's the professor gonna say? Well, that's nice. As sincere as you are, you are wrong. So it's great to be sincere, but, but that has, sincerity has nothing to do. It doesn't matter how sincerely I believe something. If it's not true, I can't make it true as sincerely as I want it to be true. I mean, we kind of live this way. Does it matter what we believe? So how many of you heard said, it's not what you believe, but that you believe? Doesn't that sound so esoteric? So wonderful. It's not really what you believe. Just believe. Now, some kind of Disney magic should be going off right now. Just, uh, how about this? 
It's not what you invest in, but that you invest. How many of you got, you know? Anybody going for that? Okay. How about this? It's not what you eat, but that you eat. Now, we're New Orleanians, so we really don't care. Just give it to us. Come off the bottom of the ocean. We don't care. Just give it to us. Okay. But would you believe that? It's not what you eat, but that you eat. No. I, I love this one. It's not what you breathe, but that you breathe. So I've just got some COVID coming through the airwaves here tonight. Just to kind of blow all that on you here. It's not what you see, because it's, it's not what you breathe. You just breathe. Just breathe. Don't worry about that anthrax stuff. Just breathe. Now, this, this one may, I may be off on this one here a little bit. It's not what you marry, but that you marry. Okay, so, I mean, some of us are getting a little old, a little long in the tooth. I mean, maybe, you know, just I'll settle for that guy, I guess, you know. But we don't live that way in terms of investment or eating or breathing or, or maybe marrying. Um, so why would we do that? Why would we do that? I can't get this to stay on. When it comes to this, it's not what you believe. Just believe it. See, if anything, I'm hoping this will challenge us to think about this, which is going to last a whole lot longer than this. And how stinking fast did it go? Those of us who have been around the block a few more times than some of you guys in the front here. <laughs> you know... Now, another question that comes with Jesus saying he is the truth um, is this. We may say that one of the things, one of the things that just people would say that bother me about Christianity, just bothers me about you Christians, um, is that you're just so exclusive. You're so narrow. Um, can I, newsflash? Um, all religions are narrow. Some things can't all be true at the same time. See, what, what Islam teaches and what Hinduism teaches is different what, than what Christianity teaches. And Christianity teaches what's different than Hinduism and, and, and Buddhism and Islam uh, or, or what Mormons teach. I mean, it's different. They can't all be true and saying something completely different at the same time. That's called the law of non contradiction. Either one of them is true and the other's false, or they're all false. They can't all be true. They just simply can't all be true. And what I love is that the God of the Bible, the God of the Bible did not ask you and me to check our brains at the door. In the fifth book of the Hebrew scriptures, that what we Gentiles call the Old Testament. It's the book of Deuteronomy. And in the sixth verse, it says this, Hear, O Israel, this is the great Jewish prayer. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Now listen to what he says here. Moses declares from God's heart, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your whole being, your your soul, your emotions, and you know what the next word is? Mind. You should love them with your mind. And notice God's not asking us to check our brain at the door. Just simply to think with it and to realize there is a God. And I'm not him. I'm not he. For us to really begin to think and ask and examine and I, I, I love that you're here. I hope you'll continue to come here. We just think together and reason together and examine together. What does the Bible say? Now, Jesus also said, not just that he was the, whoops, not just that he was the way and the truth, but that he was the life. See, this is what the Bible says. Again, not asking you to believe it, that we were made in the image of God, but we marred that image. At least our forefathers, our mother and father, Adam and Eve, as the Bible says, they marred that image when they rebelled against God and did what God told them not to do. Because God said, the day you eat of this, you shall surely die. And we're going to talk a lot more about that in week three. What does die mean? They didn't just drop dead. We'll talk about that in a moment. So why does Jesus say he is 
the life. Because in Genesis 3, where this rebellion against God took place, and God said, you shall surely die, they did. They died immediately in their relationship. If what the Bible says is true, they died immediately in their relationship to God. Then they began to die in their relationship to one another. And eventually they would die and be separated from their own bodies. And it left you and me heirs of a nature that wants what it wants, what it, when it wants it, and the heck with anybody else. And the only difference between our offense to God when we were two years old and today are the complexities of our self-centeredness and offenses against a holy God. Uh, William Ernest Henley was uh, quite the agnostic UK poet. And I, I, had, I don't know why this slide is not up here. I'm, I'm sorry. But this is the last stanza of this poem. And its father taught me this poem. But this is what the last stanza says. He writes, Henley writes this, it matters not how straight the gate. Now remember the narrow way in the New Testament? Jesus said the, the way is narrow and the way is broad. He says, it matters not how straight the gate, nor fraught with punishment the scroll, commandments. And then he says this, writes this, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Well, I guess Henley knows right now whether he was or wasn't. Um, but that was quite a statement of saying, I want what I want when I want it, and the hell with you. I want to live like I want to live. Get out of my way. See, Jesus comes in the midst of our self-reliance, if what the Bible says is true, and says, you're headed in the wrong direction. I'm the way. You're believing a lie. I'm the truth. And in terms of my, your relationship with me, you're dead. But I am the life. And he says, that's what I came to give you. To fill you, every one of us, with himself and all that he is. Now, as I'm closing up here, uh, I just I want to share you this this is from John. We spend a lot of time in scriptures out of the Gospel of John here. John 3, 16. You may be familiar with this scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So what he's saying here is this. For God so loved the world that he gave his son to us who are in the dash. That whoever believes in him in the dash would not perish, be separated from him, but would have eternal life. If you know him in the dash, you'll be with him forever in the line. That's what, that's what the scripture's saying here. So for God so loved the world that he gave to us what you and I needed. He gave the way, he gave the truth, he gave the life, and his name, according to the Bible, is Jesus. That whoever believes in him, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this word. What does believe actually mean? mean. We've got to unpack that word, and we'll do that in the next couple of weeks. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have life in the line forever. And again, this is such a corporate thing, but I, but I want this to be really, really specific to you right now, if you'll allow me. See, because God so loved Taylor that he gave Jesus that if Taylor would believe in him, he'd not perish, but have eternal life. See? For God so loved Lisa, that if Lisa would believe in him, Lisa would have life in the dash and life forever with him. Confidence in that. Not based on our goodness, but based on God's promise. Because Jesus said, hey, you ain't the way, you ain't the truth, you ain't the life. I am. Submit to me. Which is, a, submit. Don't you, we love that word. Okay. And so this is what we are seeing here. And we're going to dive much deeper into that real soon. So I'm closing out by this. I want to bring us back to uh, our 35-year-old Shia LaBeouf. Um, I don't handle fame well. Most actors on most days don't think they're worthy. I have no idea where this insecurity comes from. But it's a God-sized hole. If I knew, I'd fill it and I'd be on my way. Now, I want... 35-year-old Shia LaBeouf 
to meet 400-year-old Blaise Pascal. Here's what Blaise Pascal said around six, uh, circa 1650. He said, there is, this is Blaise Pascal, mathematician and philosopher. He said, there is a God-shaped vacuum, a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person. And it can never be filled. That's quite a statement, Blaise. Never be filled by any created thing, any, any dash thing. Okay? It can never be filled by any dash thing. It can only be filled by God who, made, who he made known through the way, the truth, and the life. That's quite a statement. The question is, is it true or not? Is it just religious hoopla and fantasy? Or is it actual truth? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about over the next nine weeks. And I hope you can make it. So what if, I just thinking about this. What if all those things that we wanted in the dash, you know, um, the houses, the cars, you know, everything that's in our garage, everything that's in our house, all those things that just really haven't fulfilled us. Um, you know, the, the IRAs and the bank accounts and all the prestige and all the clubs and all that other stuff was not for the purpose of us finding fulfillment, but frustration. So that when we got all of it, like Jim Carrey said, I think everybody needs to get everything they ever wanted so they can find out it's not the answer. See, in every man, in every woman, there's a God-shaped vacuum. If Pascal is right, that's something that needs to be considered by all of us. Could that frustration that we receive from the world be that which is making us think about something that's going to last a whole lot longer than anything we've got on this planet? Than your favorite sweater even that you've had since you're a kid? Your favorite blanket? Your favorite pillow that you've you brought it into your marriage? It's still there. Your wife wants to know when you're going to get rid of that thing. Um, so next week, here's the question. Next week, who is Jesus? Okay, we're going to have questions like this. Is there any evidence to support the Bible? Um, did Jesus Christ actually, a guy named Jesus actually walk on the planet in the first century? Uh, if so, was he resurrected from the dead? I mean, really? I mean, it, is that history or just fantasy? I, I would humbly argue those questions are just too, too important to assume there's too much at stake. If you believe there's something on the other side of your last heartbeat, there's too much at stake to assume that. So how about you and me for the next nine weeks, as often as you can come, you guys watching online, stay with us, come if you want to come. And what I encourage you to, if you want to invite somebody to come next week, if you're coming back, bring them with you. But how about we do that? The food's going to be great. I'm going to talk to the chef. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, you're going to make friendships, conversations. I guarantee you it will be impossible to leave here having not been challenged, encouraged, and thinking more, maybe more than you have in a long time, or maybe more than ever. So I'm going to quit here in a minute. We've got coffee over there. We're going to take a quick bathroom break. Just want to give just some rules for table conversation. You know, again, like I said, non-threatening environment. Just relax. You know, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Well, actually, I don't know if I believe that. I've heard some real doozies. But just go ahead and ask it anyway. Somebody else is going to ask it, so you go ahead. Um, but really, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Just, again, this is an opportunity for us to come and listen and reason together. So, and you don't have to speak, but I saw this article that I thought was really interesting. It says, happy people talk more and with more substance. So if you don't talk, we may just assume that um, you're just depressed and shallow. But, um, but I, no pressure, no pressure. So, um, hey, online viewers, I'm going to have some questions for you on the screen. And if you'd like to get, I can get you a list of questions that uh, you can just kind of ask among yourselves. And so if you need that, you can just, uh, they gave me a fake email address here, but it's frank at lakeviewchristiancenter.com. You can do that. I'd give you my office one, but it wouldn't do you any good. Um, so again, I want to thank you guys for being here next week, 630. Make it if you can. We'd love to have you. 
if you can't if you can't make it, um, you could watch live stream. If you can't watch live stream, you go to Lakeview Christian Center's YouTube page, and we will have the recording of this as well. For those who make it all 10 weeks, there is a tremendous commencement exercise, and you do not want to miss that. You will be greatly rewarded for you having maybe graduated for the first time in your life from anything. So, uh, so thank you again. We appreciate you being here. We hope to see you again next week. Thanks, y'all, for coming. Let's take a quick break.